If you have a church Bible, you can find Psalm 49 on page 567. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble? when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches, truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet, after them, people approve of their boasts. Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol, with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol for he will receive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases, for when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though, while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, His soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. The second reading is Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 13. Again, if you have a church Bible, that's on page 1049. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Well, our subject is something that we're all concerned with. We sing about it, we dream of it, 
We make plans regarding it. Whole sections of the weekend news are devoted to it. We work night and day for it. Money, money, money. It must be funny in the rich man's world. And I know also at this stage of our life together, when numbers are faced with considerable shortages and hardships, to be spending a morning thinking about money may seem an odd place to be. But as I pondered this all through the week, it struck me and I thought, you know, even in the hand-to-mouth subsistence culture of the first century Galilee, as Jesus taught, the issue of money comes up again and again and again in his teaching. And so we have to say that money preoccupies both rich and poor alike. And you will have noticed in verse 13 that the issue is presented for us by a voice from the crowd. Incidentally, another thing that strikes one as one looks through the teaching of Jesus, particularly this section, is how crowds form such a constant in the ministry of Jesus. Nowhere more so than in this section of Luke's gospel, the crowd seeks signs right at the start of chapter 11, and then at the end of chapter 12, the crowd seeks signs again, and in chapter 12, verse 1, such vast crowds have gathered that people are trampling one another, and it always strikes me how quick-footed, how consistently composed, how courageous the Lord Jesus is in front of these vast crowds. He always has precisely the answer. But let's get back to the start of our reading this morning and the voice that raises a matter that can be one of the most vexing in every age, the issue is inheritance. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, I had an aunt uh, who left just under a million pounds to a cat's home. Uh, I'm afraid some of you cat lovers won't look well on me for this, but I've never quite seen cats the same way ever since. And much more seriously, I know a farmer who died and failed to write a will, and his son had worked alongside him for 30 years, and without a will, there was a huge family fallout. The son has now been stripped of the house, the land, and works, well, pretty much as a laborer on farms. So it's a really vexing issue, isn't it? Inheritance. And in this context of this question that's shouted out from this huge crowd, Jesus tells one of his most famous parables. Here is a lesson from Jesus how, on how not to be an idiot with your money. And of course, all of us, rich and poor, we love being clever with money. So you find me a person who has managed to withstand the stock market turmoil of uh, this last six months, and indeed, maybe even 2008, 2009, I'll find you someone who finds some way, somehow, just to drop it into so many conversations, because he loved being clever with money. But then, at completely the other end of the scale, you find me somebody, however hard-pressed, who's, who's got a bargain in Poundland, or got something good on eBay, or bought a banger and done it up, and it's turned out, you know, or, or has been on um, whatever that program is, you know, uh, that we all like to watch on a Sunday evening. Antiques Roadshow, that's right. And, uh, and, and, and has got a bargain, and you just see it written all over their face, so rich and poor alike. We like to be wise, and so this parable is going to tell us how not to be an idiot with our money you'll see that there's a proverb essentially in verse 15, and then there's the parable in verses 16 through 21. And under the proverb, I'll give you a title for it. Here's what we're working with. There's more to life than stuff. And under the parable, here's a suggestion. There's more to life than life. Stuff. And the danger of money, watch out, be on your guard. Verses 13 through 15. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, 
Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? It's an extraordinary reply, isn't it? From the Lord Jesus, who's the judge of the living and the dead. And then Jesus said to him, here's the proverb, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. Now, the word abundance there is a word that speaks of surplus. If you're familiar with the Gospels, it's the word that's used of the leftovers after he's fed the 5,000. Surplus. And the word to covet, literally translated, reads more to have. And so your life doesn't consist of uh, surplus or cannot be kind of accounted by the more to haves. And Jesus' point to the listener, I think, is this. You know, you've got what you need already, you who are complaining about the inheritance. This inheritance that you're fretting over, well, it's, it's only surplus. There are far bigger things for you to be concerned with than mere stuff. And are you sure that your issues with your brother aren't signaling a much, much deeper problem in your heart? It is a remarkable reply, isn't it? It really is a remarkable reply. Uh, Verse 14 is so striking. Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? This is the Lord Jesus speaking. In the first century, the the elder brother acted as executor of the father's possessions on the father's death. And I have no doubt at all that this voice shouting out from the crowd feels hard done by by his older sibling. I'm sure there's been some tremendous injustice. And can you feel the righteous indignation? Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. It looks like he's going to walk off with a whole lot, the greedy so-and-so. And so one would expect Jesus to step in and sort it all out. Who made me a judge and arbitrator over you? It's as if he's saying, look, I've got far bigger fish to fry than simply sorting out your petty family dispute. And the fact that you're so worked up about this particular family issue suggests to me you've actually got a much deeper problem. And so the proverb, take care, be on your guard. One's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possession. How's that for a family counseling session? Jesus, a therapist. And of course, it shows us that covetousness comes in all sorts of guises. You know, he's saying to this guy, it looks to me like you've got an issue with greed. And please notice that Jesus is not here condemning having things. Jesus is no ascete. He's not asking us to go and sit on top of a pole for 10 years, uh, you know, and eat tapioca or move into a monastery, or relocate to Wales and live off lentils and nettle soup. What he's saying is this, necessary as things are, a man's life does not consist in what he has over and above what he needs for his daily needs. And the brother who shouts out, we have to assume already has what he needs, the inheritance is going to be an extra few bits and pieces, and true value is not measured by what I have. Now, immediately, this raises a whole load of applications, doesn't it? To the man or woman haggling over their pay package, to the thousands who will, in a couple of weeks' time, be scrambling over Black Friday bargains, to the eBay bid, the student loan, and so forth, to the teenager worried about her allowance, or whether he's going to get an iPhone 12. You know, covetousness, it can surface in all sorts of different guises. I found myself over the years speaking on this parable at city bonus time. I found myself teaching on this parable one Sunday, the Sunday that the Sunday Times Forbes Rich List was published. And I found myself speaking on this at times when many parents are caught up in concerns with children's school places children's mock exam results, children's future job prospects. Are you sure your anxieties over little Jemima's education or Jasper's mock GCSEs 
aren't really fueled by a more to have in the heart, deep-seated in the soul. Watch out, guard yourself. And this morning, when we're thinking about this in the context of COVID, and so many are financially extraordinarily hard-pressed, well, COVID has exposed our culture's paranoia over death. The decisions being taken, some of them extraordinary, because of our paranoia about death. Might COVID also expose a problem with a more-to-have attitude that runs like brown crystal through the greed-fueled veins of 21st century capitalist man. But that should be anathema to God's church. And so to this crowd whose value system was shaped by the Pharisees who themselves were lovers of money with an external appearance of religion but a subsurface concerning for wealth, concern for wealth and position in society, promotion and prominence, Jesus gives this great warning to the culture of his time. One's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. Value isn't measured in the excess that's been accumulated. How quickly covetousness and greed are exposed by the Lord Jesus. And then, then, of course, then, of course, leaves us asking the question, well, what is true value? And... Um, Where is true value to be found in this whole culture where more to have seems to be the kind of prevailing philosophy? And so Jesus tells the parable. And we can see that the parable concerns a wealthy individual. It's the land of a rich man. Verse 16, he told them a parable saying the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you've ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, verse 15 tells us that this farmer has had one of those unusual years which no farmer will ever admit to, that everything has lined up. The wheat prices were high, the weather in spring was perfect, the weather at harvest was ideal, the crop yield was good, neither disease nor drought, deluge nor damage hit, and so there was a plentiful harvest. The word plentiful just means to produce well. It was a bumper crop. And our friend, who is already wealthy, now starts plotting for his retirement. And you sort of think, well, can you blame him? And he's dreaming of the cruise or the holiday in Marrakesh or the fishing trips on famous rivers or simply of a little vegetable patch somewhere where there's no reception, no broadband. And of course, in the days in which Jesus taught, there weren't stock markets and fund managers. Wealth was stored in commodities, coins, garments, barns. And so you can picture our dear friend, you know, it had been a cracking investment to to sow more land to wheat that year. He'd been so wise with his money. He'd invested with a real returns fund manager. He'd seen the crash coming, and he'd actually made a killing. And how does Jesus describe him? God said to him, You fool! So we have to ask ourselves, well, how can you be an idiot with your money? in God's eyes. And I want to suggest there are two primary things that this individual gets horribly wrong. He forgets two things. He forgets that he's mortal, and he forgets that he's accountable. 
I don't know if you noticed how the first person singular dominates all the way through the early part of the parable. I, I, my, I, I, my, 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 my. What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul. It's really interesting, actually. The only time he uses the second person, the you, is to speak to himself. (laughs) He's completely self-absorbed, isn't he? I will say to my soul, soul. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. So he gives absolutely no thought to his death at all. And I've got no doubt that he had health plans and care packages and gym memberships and um, care homes all lined up. And now, with the mortgage paid off and children's needs provided for and the planned pension fund secures, Secured, he has only thoughts for his retirement. How old is he? We're not told. Maybe he's in his 50s. Some people retire at that age here in the city. And he's thinking, I've got 30 years. And God says, well, you think you're a man of the world, a shrewd investor? You stupid idiot. You brain-dead moron. You naive child. Now, I wish we could slow this right, right down because it's so packed. Uh, Alarm bells should have been ringing for us when we heard him speak to himself in verse 19. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Those words are taken pretty much straight out of Ecclesiastes 8. And there's a very similar section in Ecclesiastes that has to do with a rich man who dies and has to leave his business affairs and his money to his son. And the writer says, who knows whether the son will squander it or make something of it. And the the same idea is there in verse 20. These things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it comes basically straight out of Ecclesiastes. And the point in Ecclesiastes is that to live life with no reference to God leaves us completely exposed. However wealthy we are, we work all our life, we store up all this stuff, we die, somebody else takes hold of it, and they may be absolutely useless, and then it's all gone. And do you know, I remember hearing that passage in Ecclesiastes being spoken on. I was sitting just there, just here where Charlie is, and sitting in the front row where Wes is was a man who had just handed his whole business over to his son. It was the most marvelous. I mean, the guy speaking didn't have a clue about this as he went on about you've handed your business over to your son and he might be a complete idiot. And you could see these two kind of slightly nudging one another. But of course, it is vanity. It's meaningless because you store it all up and when you're gone... Whose is it going to be? And they could be completely useless. So he forgets that he's mortal. But Jesus doesn't simply leave it there. Verses 20 and 21 take things further than his mortality. He forgot that he was mortal and he forgot that he was accountable. God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So it's here where the wisdom or the folly of every man or woman is shown for what it is. You can be Jeff Bezos, 192 billion, or Bernard Arnault, 122 billion. You can have qualifications and achievements that fill pages of CVs. You can have been to the best schools, the best universities, worked for the best law firm. You've forgotten that your soul is ultimately accountable. And God says, you moron. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. There's more to life than life. 
there's more to life than stuff. Do you know, when you're preparing these sessions, you always think of where you would love to use it and teach on it. I would love to use this passage to speak at a school leavers service. You know, your school can top the school league tables and be turning out idiots. You can have 10 A stars at your GCSEs and be a moron. I'd love to take this passage and use it at a graduation ceremony, wouldn't you? Don't you think it'd be ideal? I've listened several times to Steve Jobs' commencement speech at Stanford Uni, you got to do what you love. But you know you can graduate. I don't know what the top grade is in an American university, but you can come. I mean, Steve Jobs never did graduate, but you can come out of Stanford University. You can have the top degree or the bottom degree, or you can crash out like Steve Jobs and whichever. If you haven't remembered that you're accountable, God says, you fool. Ultimately, we have to give account to God. Just you and God, just me and God. And they say, you know, we won't be able to take it with us, but the point here surely is it won't be any help to you when you go, or rather, have you used it in the light of that day of accountability? And so the point is not against having money or having things. We need to be wary of envy, which is equally as destructive and evil as greed, and equally as sure a litmus test of covetousness as building barns. Covetousness and greed, it can be exposed in all sorts of ways, and envy is a sure sign of it. The point, rather, is about what I do with what I have beyond my basic need. And this individual has given no thought about how he plans to use his sudden excess in order to advance the issues which concern God. No thought to a rich welcome in heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. Just a thought to the next 20 years. Here's a thought. If you had to craft a prayer for this individual that was not, I've got all I need, eat, drink, and be merry. If you had to craft a prayer, what would it be? The point, of course, is not that you and I can earn a way to heaven through using our money well. The point is that what we've been given by God has been given to us on trust, and he wants us to use it well and invest it in his business so that he will welcome us. And we need to combine the proverb of verse 15 with the conclusion of verse 21. One's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions, So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Well, it's time to draw to a close. You can see that the parable ultimately is applied to the disciples. So I wonder if you've noticed that, that Jesus speaks first to the individual, verse 15, then to the crowd, verse 16, he said to them, Ultimately, verse 22, he said to the disciples, therefore. So there are huge numbers of applications for Christians. Take care, be on your guard, watch out that lurking down here isn't a deep covetousness that you hadn't quite realized. Of course, there are big applications like that. But first and foremost, this parable is applied the crowd to the, told to the crowd, and it's meant to expose the folly of the culture in which they exist. But to the disciple, you know, you're asking, well, how can I be rich towards God? Come back next week (laughs) and, uh, and we'll explore it. Remember, it does come within the context of Martha sitting at the feet, Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus and praying, being taught to pray to our Father.
But we'll look at that, disciples, much more next week. But to the brother, you know, inheritance, it's an excess for him. He was pottering along quite happily with all that he needed until his father died. Really, we shouldn't miss what we don't have. And so his response has exposed a hidden cancer. How easily our covetousness that we never realized we had surfaces. And as I say, I guess the harm done by a younger brother probably felt very morally superior as he asked the question. And Jesus' response just slice straight through. Take care, be on your guard. But then to this crowd, isn't it interesting that in this vast crowd, so big that people were trampling on one another, Jesus asks each and every one to take care, to be on their guard, not to be a fool. And so to the wider culture, what matters is not how much I've accumulated in my bank account, nor how well resourced my pension plan is. What matters is how I stand before God. We will stand individually, personally, before the Creator. Our soul will be required of us. And the teaching of the Lord Jesus, ultimately, you know, it's not about social conditions, political situations, economic provisions, international relations, philosophical considerations. The teaching of the Lord Jesus here is intensely personal, isn't it? Have we looked at ourselves in isolation? Have we considered ourselves before God? Have we pondered, if you like, our bank account in heaven? Are we wise or foolish? This very night your soul will be required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And so the teaching to the crowd, this is the message to the wider world on graduation day. You know, there will be no shielding on the day when our soul is required of us. There will be no self-isolation on that day. I won't be able to avoid it. There'll be no social distancing on that day, no place to hide. We come into the world alone. We die one by one. We face an individual accounting. Our soul is required of us. And to potter along as if we're immortal with no consideration to that day and how we will be received in the eye of the Lord Jesus and of God himself, is to be greeted on the day of judgment as a rank idiot, no matter how much money we've accumulated and how many plaudits we've received. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we're so conscious of our own poverty and failure as we hear your teaching and how the concerns of this world infect and affect us. And so in our poverty, we come to you and ask that you would have mercy on us. And we pray, our Father, that you would enable each one of us to sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus and to learn from him. We pray for our culture, this world in which we live, where wealth and possessions form such a part of evaluation and so little thought is given to mortality and accountability. We ask that you would help us to see this world as you sees it, see it. And that in your kindness, you would bring many from our culture to their senses and cause them to turn to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness. We ask it in his name. Amen.
we will begin with some questions. William, you have trained us over a number of years to um, look at this book of Luke as written to Theophilus, and you've taken us back to chapter one. How does this give Theophilus assurance? Um, could you please show how today's passage does that? I think it, 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 I think it is a, an exposure of the culture of Jesus' age, which is actually like any culture. So the voice from the crowd is the voice of a person who may not realize it, but has a deep-seated covetousness. And the parable to the crowd is exposing the folly of living life without a personal focus on the God who will judge us. And the Pharisees in Luke 16, verse 14, 15, 16, are described as lovers of money. And every culture will have its elite who create a veneer of righteousness by which the culture is judged, but just one tiny little scratch under the surface exposes the culture for what it is, um, racked with greed. And the parable and the immediate answer is designed to give confidence to the disciple as we see the culture in which we live. Simultaneously, it cannot but give, give us pause for thought as to where we stand behind, before the living God um, because we, can so, e we so easily are affected and infected with the culture in which we live. So Luke's aim is confident certainty. And a big part of Luke and Acts is what I call certainty in the public square. And you're only going to have certainty in the public square when you can analyze the public square as the public square is. And I think this parable does exactly that. William, thank you. That links to a question that we've got from last week, I think. So about 12 verse 2 verse 3. Um, uh, it's a nice question, says thank you for a great series, there you go. Um, William said that 12 verse 2 and 3 was referring to the spread of the gospel. Please could he explain how he gets there? Is it not about the hearts of the Pharisees being revealed? That seems very important. So is this a chapter about the disciple going out to spread the gospel? I've said, I think I said it's about, it could be about both, but I am persuaded that it's about the latter it could be about the hearts of the Pharisees being exposed. That may well be so. But the section goes on, verse 8, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. And verse 11 and 12, the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And the context of those verses is Jesus in the crowd who are seeking for signs and demanding evidence even when their eyes, as it were, are, are willfully shut and their ears willfully blocked, is Jesus demanding that the gospel still go on being spoken, still go on being spoken. And so verse 3, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light and what you've whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on, on the housetops. So yes, it could be um, about elements of Phariseeism within ourselves that will be exposed, I really don't think it's that. There is an element of the Phariseeical hypocrisy being exposed, but there's also a very strong thrust of you must go on speaking publicly, you must go on speaking publicly. Anyone who denies me before man, before man I will be ashamed of on the last day. So I hope that clarifies a little bit of why we took it the way we took it. Thank you. Then um, some really good questions in application about money and security and greed. Um, and we're not going to have a chance for all of them, but it, it's exactly what we want to be doing on the Zoom and outside where it maybe is not raining anymore um, as we talk to one another um, in groups of six, if you're here at most. Um, so, William, um, where is the line between greed and security? the desire for security and greed. And someone has sent an example. Um, they phrased it as if it isn't personal, and I think I guess their age, but it, it says a big aim of the younger generation is to get on the property ladder. 
how should this passage be applied to that situation? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very, very good question. It's the more to have, isn't it? I think that's really helpful. Um, the covetousness is more to have. And so the rich man is a rich man. He's not, he's not rebuked for his wealth. He's rebuked for forgetting that he's mortal and forgetting that he's accountable. And in 1, Corinthians, in 1 Timothy 6, uh, Paul gives very specific uh, instruction to the wealthy. It's right at the end of the chapter there, if you want to look it up later. But God is not against people having money. And if you're envious of people with money, you've got a problem with greed yourself in your heart. You're covetous. So God is not against people. It's how you use it. Um, and, what, and then you're said, well, what is enough? I mean, you go to Bangladesh, and there on the streets of Dhaka, somebody is carrying everything they need in you know, just one piece of cloth material, and that's all they possess. You come back here and you think, wow, I think I need far more than I actually do. But that's left open, and I really like it that it's left open, because that then is for each one of us prayerfully to consider before the Lord and work out. And don't look over your shoulder at what I might think or what anybody else might think. It's none of my business. You're going to meet God on the last day, and he'll talk to you about it. So I love that about the gospel. You know, we're not in a kind of cult where we have to say, oh, they privately educated their children, they didn't, and they've got a big house, and they've got a small house, and we're all judging one another. And that's between us and God. And he, but you need to sit down individually or sit down as a couple and make your decisions about how you use the resources in order to please God and uh, to, 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 um, to advance the cause of the gospel. And it will be different for every single one of us there should be a vast, diverse range across St. Helens. Do you know, I've actually spoken on this parable when somebody who had invested in agricultural land um, needed to build bigger barns in order, <laughs> in order to store the harvest. It was absolutely hilarious. And I you know, I've just thought, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. But that, again, it's none of my business between that individual and the Lord as to quite how, you know, and that's between them and the Lord. We, we help each other by opening the Scriptures together, don't we? Yes, we do. So we, where, where else, someone has mentioned the passages about not being a burden on family in later life. Where, where else would be a good, if someone says, Thank I you. think this sermon is bitten for me and they want to talk further, yeah, where yeah, yeah. would you take them? I mean, that's really important. I think 1 Timothy 5 is immensely important, where Paul talks about... Um, uh, not, uh, uh, in, insofar as it is possible, not allowing yourself to become a burden to the church. He's talking about widows there, and families should provide for the widow and look after the widow insofar as is possible. And there's a very clear principle there of making sure that you're not a burden to the church. Of course, the church must, and I'm thrilled that we've got our hardship fund, but the church must care, as we'll see next week, for the poor amongst us, but insofar as is possible, yes, absolutely right. Properly to save and properly to make provision and a pension plot or whatever it happens, plot, pension pot or whatever it happens to be. Absolutely. But there are pension pots and there are pension pots and how much do you actually need? And then to be prayerful and about not being greedy. Yeah. And 1 Timothy 5 goes with 1 Timothy 6 which says, command the rich not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but to do good and be rich in good works, be generous and ready to share. So I think it's, it's between those two. Yeah. And I, I think with, with a good friend, you can have that conversation without judging. Yes, but we're not in the business, actually, uh, as a church, of saying, right, we need to see your bank account. Um, you know, you've, I've come across some, uh, basically, I call them cults, of so-called Christians who've actually said, right, we need to, act the elders have come round to the house and said, we need to see your bank account and decide how much you're going to give. No, it's between you and God. Thank you. There's two more areas I'd love to get questions on if we can. There's, there's one about that, that you said the man has been mistreated by his brother, you think. <laughs> and okay. um, if we are in that situation where oh. we've been mistreated at work or um, 
what is appropriate um, standing up for your rights uh, and what is mm. covetousness? Thank you so much. I, that's a very, very good question. Do we know that the man has been mistreated by well, that the isn't brother? the question. Let's no, assume I know, he was. I know that's not the question. So I could realise you could be picking, uh, you know, picking a hole in that. But um, in, uh, in Romans 13, Romans 12 finishes, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Romans 13 tells us that God has put governors in place in order to bring judgment in the current age. Now, that's really interesting. You might say, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Oh, well, I've just got to take it on the chin and so forth. But Paul says, no, God has put governments in place in order to keep order in the world. We happen, because we're living in a culture that has been profoundly influenced by Christianity, I mean, it's all de being demolished now around, our, around us, but we happen to live in a culture where there are wonderful legal protections for people in the workplace. Romans 13 is a wonderful thing, isn't it? But as you seek the legal protection, look out, covetousness. Who would have thought this guy, wanting to have a proper settlement of his parents' will, it looks like having been hard done by by his brother who will not share the property, who would have thought that Jesus would have said, you've got a real problem with greed? Who would have thought it? And so now, as you seek proper protection in, thank God, a culture that has been impacted so profoundly by the Christian gospel that we've got it, haven't got it in other cultures that had no gospel, praise the Lord for the gospel over many centuries. As you seek, be very careful and be on your guard because just a little scratch under the surface, this guy's greedy as whatever. Does that, does, do you think that helps? I, I, think it does, I think elsewhere as well, it's the, they are brothers, these two, and in seeking justice in the way that he does, he, he is having an effect on his future relationship with his brother. Yeah. Yeah, and elsewhere, right. the Bible calls us, what is most important here? What do you want most? What is the right thing to do? But it, it's enormously... Well, I thought of doing a little section on that in terms of what pleases God and wrecking family relationships and that sort of thing. I think he comes next week to what pleases God. And so I've slightly decided to leave what pleases God to next week. We know already that Jesus wants us to sit at his feet and listen to his teaching and allow his teaching to impact our loves and desires and delights. So that's one part of it. Next week, we got much more for the disciple on what pleases God. Thank you. So yes, so most of these questions, William could have just said, come next week, come next week, come <laughs> next week. Here's one I think you're not allowed to on. So um, this is addressed to the crowd. So any advice, this last question, on how to use this passage in conversations with those who aren't yet Christians. <laughs> okay, thank you, yes. Probably I wouldn't start with, you idiot. Okay, I realize, I realize that's fairly blunt. But it is what Jesus says. I mean... He's a, he's a lot less kind of worried than, than we are. But I do think talking about death, I mean, it's, it's in Ecclesiastes that we're told, isn't it, that the wise person spends his life in the house of mourners. And actually thinking about the reality of death um, it is a really important thing to do, to realize that we could go at any moment. That was last week, wasn't it? God knows and help people to think about that. And even to ask the question, you know, what importance in the light of our mortality do you think our possessions have? And have you ever thought at all about the judgment that will face you in front of God? I think I'd, I, I want people to think very hard about that. You know, this, in this vast crowd, it's just me and God on the last day, one by one by one. And uh, next Monday, so Pierce's day job is telling people that they have cancer. Mm. Um, and so we'll talk to him about how do you help people think about death. Um, and then his own personal story is of realizing for all his incredible advantages, where he turns... Uh, his life, you know, from severe disadvantage to incredible advantage, 
guilt. He had no answer mm -hmm. to guilt. So, um, yeah, so do... May I say just one final mm. comment? Uh, they're inevitably, you know, either listening uh, abroad or at home or whatever. There'll be people, you know, who've had medical diagnoses, um, you know, that are very... Um, are relevant to this individual. You know, this night your soul will be required of you. Mm. And, um, you know, if that's you and you suddenly think, my goodness, I've spent my whole life not thinking. I, I have thought I'm immortal and I've never thought I'm accountable. You know, I'm going to stand before God and I'm terrified. Well, I, th I think I want to say two things. To the, to the person who's not yet trusting the Lord Jesus... I want to say, you know, if you come to Jesus, um, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And rest there is eternal life. It's new creation, paradise. And it's a gift. So actually all the anxiety that this parable quite rightly creates over my mortality and accountability can be solved just like that as I turn to Jesus. And then to the person who's perhaps a Christian who said, well, I've just had a diagnosis of that sort and I suddenly realize the way I've done this, that, and the other. Just remember the parable Jesus tells in Matthew 20 where um, the laborers in the vineyard, you know, one starts at 23.59 hours <laughs> and the other starts at um, the other back along at 0100 um, and actually the Lord... Uh, it, it gives blessing to both. So there is, there is an account in heaven. Heaven is not flat like that. There is reward in heaven. But if you find yourself thinking, oh my goodness, I spent my, my whole life and I've actually not sought any of the treasure in heaven, the Lord Jesus, the man who comes in at 2359, um, is, is welcomed and just thrilled and delighted and treated as a child and blessed. And so don't be anxious in that regard. But if you are, if you've not worked out what you're going to do when you face God in judgment, be very, very anxious because he thinks that you're a fool. Well, thank you. I'm going to read a verse from 1 Peter as we close. Though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen.